Reconnecting with your true Christian heritage starts with language, context, and facts. And for the last 1600 years, you've been fed a thin gruel indeed of all three. In today's episode, we open up the spiritual menu and order in a second language that should come to you pretty easily. Hello, leave me a restaurant. Cheeseburger, cheeseburger, two Pepsi, one cheek. Cheeseburger, cheeseburger, two Pepsi, one cheek. Is it all Greek to you? Long before God decided to reveal himself to us by sending his only son, he prepared the way for him so that his message could be universally heard and understood. You may have heard of it or know it as preparing a path, making the way. That's what God did for his son about 300 years before he descended from heaven to Capernaum and began preaching the holy word right in the middle of enemy territory preaching it to all people, including Jews, who would later attempt to kill him multiple times before finally being allowed to temporarily succeed. Now, as readers of the very first Bible, the pre-Nicene Bible, know, Jesus transcends race. We know our Christian God was only revealed through his Son, and he doesn't play favorites with one group over another, but instead loves us all equally as his children. And he had a very important message for his children, and he wanted all of them to understand it. But even back in 1 AD, this would have been a huge problem. You see, 2,000 years ago, the entire worldwide population was over 200 million, and there were almost 6,000 different languages and dialects being spoken. That's a lot of Berlitz courses. Even Latin was only spoken by 18% of the known world, and Hebrew? Forget it. Maybe 0.001% of the world even heard of it, much less spoke it. Even the Jews themselves barely used it, except for scribbling on their law scrolls. No, both can be dismissed from consideration as being part of any worldwide path being made for Jesus to communicate with us. Let's do a quick rundown on the other big languages spoken at the time and see if any of those fit. Let's see. We have Arabic, Sanskrit, Tamil, Chinese, Aramaic, Egyptian, Sumerian, Persian, and... and Greek. Now, some of our more astute and adept listeners and viewers would say, well, the answer has to be Greek. I mean, after all, it's not only in the title of today's show, but the New Testament and the Gospels were all written in Greek. Even all of Paul's original epistles were written in Greek. So the answer has to be Greek. Now, most people would be pretty comfortable with that answer on a game show. They might even have a smug look of satisfaction as they said it. But unfortunately, they'd be wrong, or rather, they'd be half right. You see, there was only one language that everybody in the known world spoke at that time, and it didn't matter if you were an Egyptian king, a Persian rug maker, or a Roman soldier, or a wandering Jew, rich or poor, educated or a goat farmer. Everybody knew it spoke it, and understood it. And that language was called Koine, Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-E, Koine. And Koine means common, so common Greek. But the story of how it became the language of God and lingua franca would begin over 300 years earlier. And at the heart of that story is a man named Alexander. You know him as Alexander the Great and a new world-changing technique used to blend diverse cultures and language called Hellenization. Both would be used by God to prepare the path for Jesus and his message. The Hellenistic Age was a time when Greeks came in contact with outside people and their Hellenic classic culture blended with the cultures from Asia and Africa to create a blended culture. One man, Alexander, king of Macedonia, a Greek speaker, is responsible for this blending of cultures. Now, I'm gonna spare you having to relive social studies classes from high school, so let's just suffice it to say that in 
just a few short years beginning in 336 BC, Alexander the Great, mounted on his trusty steed Bucephalus, conquered all the lands that would become so important to both the coming mission of Jesus and later the travels of the Apostle Paul as he established new Christian churches in these exact same cities following the very path of Alexander's armies. But because of the larger goals and vision involved in his conquests, a, a vision he may not have been acutely aware of, but probably sensed that he was involved or part of a greater goal, Alexander, he, he didn't humiliate his enemies after defeating them. His goal wasn't to plunder them and rub their faces in it. It wasn't to kill all their women and children as the Jews did countless times on instructions from their deity as they themselves claim in their Torah, later renamed the Old Testament. Instead, he did the exact opposite. He Hellenized them, going so far as to marry various princesses in Persia and even Afghanistan to ensure the path he was laying would endure for centuries. Now, of tangential interest is that the Jews sided with Persia against Alexander the Great during the war, and as usual, as we see time and time again, placing themselves on the wrong side of God's will. And shortly after his victory, according to scholars, Alexander was poisoned by unknown persons and died at the age of 32. Now, as regular viewers and listeners are aware, some of these episodes inevitably end up taking little historical side journeys as the result of facts and content that we feel is relevant and germane to issues of today. Now, I don't want anyone to get lost in the weeds here, but it may be worth taking a moment to reflect, to contrast and compare Alexander's actions using nonviolent Hellenization to create a worldwide change versus the satanic methods being used today by the enemies of all mankind, as described by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2.15. It's almost as if Satan's parasites are deliberately using reverse Hellenization to murder, poison, and enslave the world as they redefine words and reclassify evil as good and good as evil. But rest assured, people like Klaus Schwab and George Soros, or whatever their real names are, don't even measure up to a stray fingernail clipping of Alexander the Great. You see, one side worked on behalf of our Christian God, the other works on behalf of their deity, Satan. And what should we call this reverse Hellenization, this inversion of good and evil? Should we call it Talmudization? I really don't know, but you're welcome to leave your ideas in the comments section. Now then, this Hellenization process would be used throughout Africa, Asia, Persia, and the Mediterranean, and with it, the Koine Greek language would be cemented everywhere in the known world, the common language creating a common bond among all. Now, this was also a time of advances in learning, math, art, and architecture. Some of the great names of learning in this age included Archimedes, Hero, and Euclid. The great cities of the Hellenistic Age included Antioch in Syria, Pergamum in Asia Minor, and Alexandria in Egypt with its Library of Alexandria, the largest library of the ancient world. And interestingly, although none of these cities were in Greece, they all had Greek architecture. And finally, although the Greeks believed in many lesser gods, they believed that there was only one creator, but they didn't have a name for him at the time. You see, they were about as close to knowing God as you can get before he finally revealed himself through his son Jesus 300 years later. Now that we know the rest of the story and how the path was laid for its use, let's see this coiny Greek in action. Well, Jesus speaking to Pontius Pilate, coiny Greek. Jesus speaking to Roman soldiers, coiny Greek. Jesus delivering the Sermon on the Mount, he did it in coiny Greek. Jesus debating Jews, coiny Greek. Jesus casting out demons, coiny Greek. 
Jesus teaching the apostles. E octo ete ke emisu etus katokis ente ye Israel en Jerusalem. Po, posa ete? Octo ete ke emisu metat hafta em elapon ergasian en te Elvetia en te Britannike uh, Switzerland. Also in Koine Greek. Every New Testament, every Gospel, Koine Greek. Paul's original epistles borrowed from a Marcionite church by St. Jerome before being translated into Latin, yeah, Koine Greek. The last words of Jesus before death, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, unquote. You guessed it, Koine Greek. The oldest inscription in the world bearing the name of Jesus is on a Marcionite church in Syria, written in what? Oh, that's right, Koine Greek. Now, these are the facts, and they are undisputed. As Christians, we are compelled to always seek the truth, then hold fast to it. And as we peel away the layers of the onion, we find that truth always is leading to the very first Bible of 144 AD, the pre-Nicene Bible with its one gospel, the gospel of the Lord, and Paul's original ten epistles. And we find our Christian roots and heritage to be Greek, not Hebrew. In fact, both Paul and Jesus warn us explicitly about them. I mean, imagine thinking that the Christian church grew because Hebrew was used and Jews were converted. Well, that dog won't hunt. And history and facts take us in the opposite direction every time. And despite 1600 years of Judaizers trying to confuse you by stapling two different religions together and weaving false gospels to further their narrative, the truth remains solid as a rock if you're willing to seek it. Now, we're living in some extraordinarily dangerous times as Christians, and it's very important that your feet and beliefs are on solid theological foundation. Remember, when you hear someone say, it's all Greek to me, there's a very good reason for it. Let's wrap up today's episode with some viewer mail, a couple housekeeping items, and well, why not, a little music. The music you're going to hear is the oldest complete musical composition in the world. It's called the Song of Seculos. I hope I pronounced that right. And it's dated back to around the first century BC in Greece. So it's possible that the apostles or even Jesus himself may have heard this song. Thanks to what? Hellenization. And our viewer mail this week is from PL in the United States. And it reads in part, I now understand what you mean by Judaizers. You're referring to both the ancients and the modern ones, like Messianic Jewish Christians who are trying to tell Christians that we should follow Torah, the law of the Old Testament God, and Jewish holy days. She continues, I have been flabbergasted to learn that Paul received the gospel directly from the Lord. I always thought that was meant figuratively, not literally. Now, so much of what Paul said makes sense, and I love the simplicity of one gospel, one Lord. Well, not only is she correct, she explains it better than I ever could, so thank you for sending that in. Now, we touched on a lot of different subjects today, and I'm going to try and have links for some, if not all of them, in the show notes, so you can do some independent deep dives on your own if you'd like. And just a reminder that the very first Bible has been translated into Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese. And it's available as a free ebook at lapromerabiblia.org. And as always, you can get it in English at theveryfirstbible.org.org. And speaking of books, the FBN Book of the Month is titled The First New Testament by Dr. Jason Badoon. It's an excellent read when you want in depth analysis of the backstory behind the Bible and why the original looks so different from what we have today. And finally, as I'm sure you're aware, getting any kind of actual news that hasn't been filtered, narrated, hydrogenated, and degaussed by the anti Christian media monopolies is nearly impossible. But FBN is hoping to help change that with first news and our new video headlines. They're a 
daily 30-second clip of the top stories viewed through the prism of pre-Nicene Christianity. You can check that out at news.firstbiblenetwork.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Darren Kalama with First News. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. Ten books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.